session 96 and we continue with the interesting and the life-changing exploration into the mystery of God's word from the beginning. I'm just reminded of Colossians 2 where Paul says the history and the mystery that God has given in his word that has been hidden from the beginning is broken open in these days to his believers and those searching for him so that the understanding and the wisdom of his word of this mystery can be revealed to those who's got an ear to hear and an eye to see i've paraphrased and i've combined a couple of verses together but i'm just astonished um we we ended last week with a king must not have too many horses and look at the mystery behind this look at look at the amazing exploration we can find in only this one uh, seemingly boring um unrelevant um commandment what does it mean to us today a king must not have too many horses he he, he mustn't send back his people to egypt to go and buy horses uh, do you remember deuteronomy 17 verse 16 and 17 he shall not multiply horses to himself don't cause your people to return to egypt to multiply your horses you shall not return any more to egypt and the next verse verse 17 is i don't think god is you know putting women in the same context as horses but verse 16 he says don't multiply horses and verse 17 he says don't multiply women don't multiply wives why they will turn your heart away um, and neither shall you multiply silver and gold um, so horses um, your your power um, proof that you're a great king and that you've got a huge army don't especially from Egypt don't ever go and buy horses um, to multiply and show your strength by the horses but especially from Egypt it doesn't mean that the king couldn't have horses it doesn't mean that the king couldn't have wives it doesn't mean that the king couldn't have gold and silver but the moment you return to Egypt in the spiritual looking at our lives today the moment we return to Egypt to go and get horses power strength um, sometimes we we wonder in this world where will our power come from what do we need to go into the last days do we need the strength of this world do we need the survival that is to be found in egypt because out of egypt comes the, comes pharaoh and he rules and reigns the whole world and he's a slave master and he's the uh, picture of the antichrist today and what is it that will make us survive in these days we need horses we need to go to egypt and we need to get the economy of this world to help us survive and and uh, and we need lots of wives the, the the kings wanted lots of wives um we're going to look at solomon now the exact opposite everything that god said in deuteronomy in the mystery in the importance listen to my torah everything he said in deuteronomy 17 here comes king solomon um 1 kings 10 verse 28 and solomon had horses brought out of egypt exactly what god said he should not do for heaven's sake solomon you were the wisest of all men and and the deuteronomy 17 verse um, 18 said that if you sit on the throne you'll write a copy of the law and you will read from this all the days of your life solomon what happened to you you went to egypt and you brought lots and lots and thousands of horses for yourself from egypt but not only did he bring horses out of egypt in direct contradiction to the law but 1 kings 11 verse 1 king solomon loved many strange women of which one was the daughter of pharaoh he did not only bring horses out of egypt he brought the daughter of Pharaoh out of Egypt and he mingled his seed with her. He married her, became one with her. He became, he, he made Israel mingle with the sun god religion 
and with a slavery system and with paganism, the daughter of Pharaoh. But not only that, that he, he, he uh, married women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, whoever the heck they were, and the Hittites. And listen to this. Of the nations which Yahuwah said clearly in his Torah unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For why? Why am I such a hard father? Why am I telling you not to go to Egypt and bring your power and your strength out of Egypt? Why am I telling you not to marry the, the, the women of, of Egypt? Because they will turn away your heart after their gods. They will turn away your heart after their systems. They will um, dilute your faith. And, and steal your devotion from the one true creator, God of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. And they will dilute it like you um, pour oros in a glass and you dilute it with water. And you will have a little bit of devotion to Yahuwah and a little bit of devotion to all these other gods. And you'll have a little bit of trust in Yahuwah. And you'll have a lot of trust in your own horses. You'll have a little bit of trust in, in God's provision. And you'll have a lot of trust in your own silver and gold. The Bible predicts that we are going to throw our silver and gold in the streets. is going to be worth nothing. The richness of this world, which the world system is currently trying to take away from the normal man on the street by taking us into a one world government and a one monetary system. And without you taking the mark of the beast, you cannot even be part of this world economy that is coming. But God said, don't, don't um, uh, multiply for yourself gold and silver and horses and wives. That is coming out of the world. No. Buy from me, says Yeshua, um, gold that is purified by fire and and let me dress you in in white robes that is washed so you don't look like this world at all 1 kings 11 2 says solomon clave unto these women in love he loved his pagan wives and they just like God predicted in Deuteronomy 17, as he warned in his beautiful Torah, they will um, steal your heart away and they will drive you um, towards their gods. And, and, and you will start looking towards something else than God, than Yahuwah. 1 Kings 11.3, and he had 700 wives, for heaven's sakes. Some of us can not imagine how to deal with even a second wife. How, how do you deal with a second wife? He had 700 princesses and he had 300 concubines. Oh, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was no longer perfect with Yahuwah, his Elohim as was the heart of David, his father. Yeshua is the son of David, the king of kings, sitting on the throne forever, having a heart like David, even through making mistakes, repenting of those mistakes, but always, always turning back to God. A heart like David when he was um, persecuted by King Saul. Do you know that David was persecuted for 20 years he was hiding in rocks and caves for 20 years from, from King Solomon. But during that time, if you read the books of the, all the Psalms that he wrote, you can see how many of those Psalms has he written while he was hiding in caves. How his love and his trust in this one true God without gold, without silver, without wives, without horses of strength, Without the strength of this world, he found his strength in God and he, and he stuck to the promises that God made to him when he was anointed to become king. He didn't say, oh God, I mean, it's 20 years already. When am I going to get to become king? No, 
David endured in his faith. And like uh, Paul says in Colossians 2, when, when the mystery that was hidden from the beginning is revealed to the people that, that has faith and believe and trust in God, then they are stable in their faith. He calls it stability of faith. May our hearts be rejoiced when we see the stability of faith among the brothers. Colossians 2. Because of this mystery that we now reveal, that, that, that we search out and that the Spirit is revealing to us and the Word is, is being broken up, the, open, this mystery is being broken open for us. Looking at one little commandment, don't bring horses out of Egypt. Understanding the significance for us, we cannot return to Egypt. We have to trust this God that through the slavery and the, and the entrapment of this Pharaoh system, he is going to come and judge Egypt, the whole Antichrist system. And he will bring about his, his plagues and his judgments um, and his recompense and his revenge on his enemies. But we who buy silver and gold that is purified with fire, which is the Torah. The Torah is the gold that um, is worth much more than anything. David says that your Torah is so precious to me. It is precious more, more than silver and gold. That is the way to live for people who want to come out of Babylon and come out of Egypt and walk on this road. Although it took 20 years for Joseph from the time he um, was stolen from his father to be reunited with his father. It took 20 years for David from the time he was anointed to the time that he became king. Yeshua went through hell on earth. Um, and it... it it, it looks like everything might be going down the drain, even in the environment we are in today. But we need to understand that God has a mystery from the beginning, there in the Garden of Eden, when he said, the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. We need to trust in that and, and hide in the caves, you know, in uh, being separate, holy, separated from this world, hiding from what is going on in this world, not, not allowing ourselves to be part of that. So we can trust and keep faith in that promise. He is going to, to save this earth and take it out of the hand of the serpent kingdom and is going to restore his kingdom. And if we want to be part of that, we cannot have horses, gold, silver, wives, mixed tradition, mixed religion, half-hearted belief in God. We need to follow Moses and we need to follow Joshua into the promised land and we need to walk behind the Ark of the Covenant through the wilderness, trusting this God, even though it might become difficult, even though there's no water and, and no food. And God says, I suffered you to be hungry and thirsty, to test you, to see if you're going to cleave to me and if you're going to obey my commandments and if you're going to trust me. And David says, even if I do walk through the valley of the shadow of death, meaning that there are valleys of shadows of death, we are not exempt from it. And, and in that valley is his rod and, and his staff going to protect and to guide us? Are we going to allow his rod and his staff to protect us? Because the rod, the rod represents the Torah, the, the education, the instruction. He's going to rule with a rod of iron, but he's also the good shepherd and he's got a staff. Not only must we allow the rod to discipline and teach us, but the staff of the good shepherd to guide and protect us through this journey. Oh, King Solomon, if only you had done what the Torah said, if only you had written the book of the law, he probably had, and he probably read from it when he was younger. But the Bible says when he grew old, 1 Kings 11 verse 5, Solomon went after Ashtoreth, Ashtoreth the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, 
the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of Yahuwah, and he went not fully after Yahuwah, as did David his father. Evil and abominations in this life has got to do with being having your heart turned away from God, not walking perfect with Yahuwah, and not having um, your heart fully turned towards Yahuwah. So the moment you turn away from this road, from the way, the truth and the life, you fall into this evil and abomination. And that's not only got to do with worship of false gods, because I mean, surely we don't worship false gods in the church religious system of today. But with for us who has already um, followed Moses and, and, and has taken our hearts out of the um, slavery of sin in, in Egypt, and we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts. And we've been baptized in the Red Sea. And we are now walking in the wilderness. We are those that don't worship the false god. We have come out of that. But still, to not have your heart fully turned to God in trust. In faith that he will bring you through the wilderness. It is very similar. Worship to false gods is bad. But not trusting Yahuwah 100% is also evil. Because isn't he trustworthy? I mean, look today. The only language that has survived since biblical times up to today is Hebrew. The language of God. What other language? What other ancient language is being spoken today? Nothing. The language of the Bible has survived through all these years. What other um, city has survived? Jerusalem. From the time that, um, what's his name? Melchizedek was king of Salem. Jerusalem is the, is the city of God. What other city has survived? What other city is the capital city of a country? And, and has remained such over um, thousands of years? But Jerusalem, what other country is still called the same name? It has been from the time, from the beginning, Israel, from the time that God promised Abraham, that specific Hamakum, that place, that location. What other nation has survived with a Torah? The instructions of a God that is still being kept today although not 100% by the, by the Jewish nations, but more and more by the Gentiles that's coming back, the lost sheep that's coming back. What other Torah has survived? What other language? What other city? What other country? This God who wrote this Bible is as trustworthy as we can see because we look at the sun. It comes up every single morning just as he commanded it in Genesis 4, um, Genesis 1, on the fourth day, it's still coming up every single day. Having our hearts stable in faith, fully trusting God, not trusting in the horses of Egypt, not trusting in, in, in our silver and gold, but trusting this God that he will fulfill his promises, even though we might be going through a valley of the shadow of death. 1 Kings 11 verse 7, Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Very interesting, all these uh, false gods. Ashtoreth, and Molech, and Molcom, and Chemosh. Very, very interesting in these days to look at what these deities, these false pagan gods, represent very interesting anyway likewise did he for all his strange wives who burned incense and sacrificed unto their gods if only solomon had remained faithful to god if only he obeyed the commandment not to multiply wives not to go to egypt for horses and especially not to take Egypt's women for his wives and, and, and all the pagan nations that they were supposed 
to destroy and alienate and chase out of the land before they took um, um, possession of the land. If only he had listened. But he was turned away. His heart was turned away. And, and then the rest of the books of kings explain to us out of all the kings of Judah and all the kings of Ephraim, of the northern um, kingdom, there were so few whose hearts were turned to Yahuwah. And unfortunately, that is to be seen today. Looking around us today, whose heart is really towards Yahuwah? Looking at the mystery that he has hidden from the beginning, the mystery in the life of Abel, Noah, Joseph, the mystery of the Aleph Taf in Genesis 1 verse 1, all these mysteries, all the warnings he gave us, Genesis 3, and all the prophecies like Genesis 6 and Genesis 7 and the Tower of Babel, looking at the mystery that is today being revealed so that we can understand to turn back to God and to trust Him wholeheartedly. Although this world is going down the dumps and the Tower of Babel is being erected and everybody wants to speak the same language and do the same things and everybody everybody is bowing before the world government and just obeying all their stupid laws that they are indoctrinating us with to make us more and more ready and open to say, yes, my government, for everything else they are going to impose on us. Because at the end of the day, the king must not have too many horses. We don't have any more kings. Our kings have all gone astray. They've all walked after other gods. We have one king, Melech Tzadik, the righteous king, the king of kings, who came as this mystery from Genesis, from the beginning, and he is revealed to us as the power that is holding everything together. The whole star system, the whole ecological balance, even the molecules in your body, is being held together by the power of the creation, the word that God spoke in the beginning, is still holding everything together. And that is the word of God, this mystery that is revealed to us that we are searching for. And we found him. He is to be found. Um, the disciples ran to, oh, what was it? I can't remember his name. Hmm. One of the twelve disciples, he was he was somewhere sitting under a tree or something. And they ran to him and they said, We found him. We found the Messiah of which Moses and the prophets spoke about. And we today, we can run to our brothers and sisters and said, We found him. He's not just a New Testament phenomena. He is the mystery written to us in the Torah. He's the one who brought us out of Egypt and he's the one that's telling us not to go back to Egypt and he's the one in whom we trust, the rock of our salvation, the rock on which we build our house so that our faith can be stable and the storms and the wind and the waves can come and we will not be knocked over and we will suffer hunger and thirst and, uh, and heat in the wilderness and we've got the Amalekites biting like hyenas from the back and we've got all these strange nations trying to infiltrate us when Biliam came to curse us and he and he sent all the prostitutes into um, the camp and then we've got people like Phineas who, who's got a zeal for God and, and he will and he will show the rest of us don't be compromised in your faith and he killed that prostitute with a with a Hebrew guy that was busy sleeping with her all these things are happening with us we we are being attacked from all sides <laughs> but God says <clears throat> I think it's Psalm 18 with my God I can go against a band uh, my God, um, a band storm, and with my God I will jump over a wall me and my God maybe I'm just one with you maybe I'm just 
we are just two, <laughs> but where two or three are gathered in the name of Yod Hey Vav Hey, which means so much more than what the churches are teaching. As long as there's two or three that sings hymns to Jesus, they say the Spirit is there. The Spirit is the one that reveals the mystery of the Word of God in His Torah, showing us the way of life so that we can endure all the way to the end. I'm going to continue with the next um, Torah commandment to be found in uh, Deuteronomy 23, verse 14 and, th- and um, from verse 13. It's got to do with preparing a shovel for each soldier to dig with. Deuteronomy 23. Um, this is quite interesting. I'm going to read Deuteronomy 23 from verse 9. When the host goes forth against your enemies, then keep you from every wicked thing. So when you um, overthrow your enemies, don't um, don't take any of their wicked um, treasures or, or um, and and don't um, um, what's the how can I explain this? They weren't supposed to mingle with anything wicked of the enemy. Sometimes there's interesting things. And, and all these wives and, and all these treasures and the, and the booty. Um, but, but God says, keep you from every wicked thing when you go against your enemies. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness, that chances him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp and he shall not come within the camp. All right, this has got to do with uncleanness. We have discussed this a little bit before about all the body, bodily fluids and, and all the um, fluids that can come out of sores or, or um, infections, you know, all that kind of stuff. We've discussed that before. All right, but it shall be when evening come, he shall wash himself and then can he come into the camp again. Um, you shall have a place. This is interesting. Okay, outside of the camp, whether you shall go forth. And you shall have a paddle upon your weapon. <laughs> um, I'll explain this afterwards. And it shall be when you will ease yourself outside of the camp that you will dig with your paddle, with your shovel, and you shall turn back and cover that which came out of you. So it's talking about um, pooping when you go to poop. If you want to have um, a poop outside, you go outside the camp. Because inside the camp, when you have warred against your enemies, you don't bring any of their abominations inside the camp. When there's an unclean man or woman or or any uncleanness or sickness or illness, you go outside the camp. If you want to go poop, you go outside the camp. If you if you want to pee, you go outside the camp. You don't pee and poop inside the camp. All right, and when you go outside the camp, you don't just poo there on a on a piece of land and you leave it there for the next guy to step into. No, no, no. You take a shovel with you. It's like your weapon, and and you and you dig a hole and you ease yourself in the hole and you turn back and cover that which came out of you with 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 ground with sand. Why? Why must the camp of God be holy and clean? It's exactly the same reason why God said, do not multiply women or horses or gold and silver from the enemies. Because Deuteronomy 23 verse 14, Yahuwah walks in the midst of your camp. Your holy, amazing, clean, beautiful, almighty creator walks inside your camp. He does not want to see poop or pee or any uncleanness or any wicked thing. He doesn't want to see horses from Egypt either. He walks inside your camp to deliver you and to give you your enemies. Therefore shall your camp be holy that no unclean thing is there for him to see. Because, listen to this, if he sees an unclean thing, he will turn away from you. Just like the multiplication of horses and wives turned away Solomon's heart 
from God. So God can turn away from us if we have any uncleanness. I'm not talking about poop because we've got toilets today. So I mean, I'm not talking about the physical. By now you should take this deeper into the mystery level. If he finds any uncleanness, even doubt in your heart is an unclean, unholy thing for him. And when he comes and walk inside your camp, inside your congregation, inside your house, inside your heart, inside the place where you and he comes together, maybe even on Shabbat to spend time together and, and you are in the camp and he's in the camp and we, we have communion with him and we have relationship with him and he comes inside the camp and he sees an unholy thing. He's going to turn away. We clean our camp. There must be no animal poop even. When your animals have defiled the camp, you clean it up because God with his beautiful feet are going to walk inside that camp. How can you even think that he must step into, into animal poop? Or, or how, how can his eyes even see any abomination inside your camp? How when he looks into your heart, can there be hidden sin or, or, or doubt or, f- or fear? And it's not wrong to fear, but your fear must be submissive to your faith. That's why Paul says in Colossians 2 that this mystery of God must give you stability of faith. Even inside the camp and outside, maybe the Amalekites are approaching or Egypt is is coming to attack or inside the camp, there must be no fear that is greater than faith. While you are fearing, while Gideon was afraid, he still shouted for God, for Yahuwah. While Joshua and Caleb was afraid, they said God promised he will give these giants of this country to us. We must go and fight. And so many other examples. So, so many. Let God walk inside the camp and let us look at this Torah commandment that says, you must have a shovel to go and relieve yourself with. It's not that obvious just to read this commandment and quickly jump to the next one. No, because the Bible says no unclean thing will enter into the new Jerusalem. Um, somewhere, somewhere it prophesies that from now on will no uncircumcised or unclean or any abomination come into you again, O holy city. So we, we leave that all behind when we leave Egypt. And as we go through the wilderness, more and more we learn what is unacceptable to him. We leave it behind. And we learn through, through trials and tribulations to trust on him. And it becomes more and more difficult in these last days when all the world is going in one direction and we don't want to go in that direction. But we've learned We've learned from the wilderness journey that we need to keep our camp holy. We need to wash ourselves when there's uncleanness in us. And we need not to mix with any of these abominations or trust in any of these horses of Egypt. We are a holy and a peculiar people to this almighty God. Uh, All right. Uh, let me end with the following uh, last uh, commandment that we're discussing today, Deuteronomy 20, verse 6. Um, and it's got to do with, do not let any of the seven Canaanite nations remain alive. God specifically commanded Israel to kill seven of the Canaanite nations. Man, woman, child, animal. And we've discussed this months, almost more than a year ago in Genesis 6 so that you guys can understand God is not a genocidal genocidal maniac. He had very, very good reason to destroy the seed lines of these seven Canaanite nations. He didn't say kill every human being that was living in Israel. These specific nations. Deuteronomy 20 verse 16 to 18. But of the cities of these people, which Yahuwah your Elohim gave you for an inheritance, you shall save Alive, nothing that breathes. 
but you shall utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you, because they will teach you to go after their abominations, which they have done unto their gods, and then you will sin against Yahuwah your Elohim. So God said to them, He commanded them in Deuteronomy already to destroy these nations. And yet, just like Solomon, they did not listen. And what was the result at the end of the day? Like God said, these nations will be a thorn in your flesh. You will never get rid of their slavery and their attacks and their um, deception and their gods and, and all their abominations. And I will turn away from you. And eventually you'll be scattered all over the earth. I will leave you. You'll go into exile, into Babylon. You're going to go through so much trouble. Why don't you just listen to me, Adam and Eve? Why did we just, just not have faith in this God to trust him? What he says is trustworthy and we must listen to him. The mystery that is in his Torah is so beautiful. If only we had eyes to see and ears to hear. But for those who does, for those who circumcise their ears and their hearts, he will reveal this beautiful mystery and make it alive. Like the Bible says, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And it is a two-edged sword and it's, it's um, it, uh, a flame scarp. It's very sharp to cut asunder bones and marrow and to reveal the intentions of the heart. And that very same sword is the one with which Yeshua, our King, who does not multiply horses from Egypt, our King, who does sit on the throne, and who does have the, the book that he wrote of the law on his lap, and he reads from it day and night, and he teaches us to follow that. He is the greatest in the kingdom. He is the one that is being revealed to us in these last days.